Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Ask the Doctors Workshop for Bipolar Disorder. My name is Dr. Stuart Butler. I'm the Regional Director of Behavioral Health and Addiction Medicine for Kaiser Permanente in Northern California and a newly minted uh, NAMI California board member. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert McCarran. Dr. McCarran is completed a dual residency in internal medicine and psychiatry at Rush University and received board certification in psychiatry, psychosomatic medicine, and internal medicine. He's triple boarded, which is not easy uh, to have happen. While on faculty at the University of California, Davis and Irvine Schools of Medicine, he started the only two uh, based combined internal medicine psychiatry residency programs. In these roles, he received grant support to create and implement a med psych curriculum that can be used in the public mental health system by psychiatry resident training programs. Dr. McCarran served as director of the only Sacramento County Crisis Stabilization Unit and started the pain psychiatry clinic and med psych clinic within the UC Davis Division of Pain Medicine and Internal Medicine, respectively. Dr. McCarran is the founding director of the UC Davis Train New Trainers, the TNT, Primary Care Psychiatry Fellowship which is a one-year program designed to train primary care providers in the essentials of psychiatry and pediatric behavioral health. It's important. Dr. McCarran now serves as professor, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine and Assistant Dean, Continuing Medical Education at the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine. He's also Director of Education for the UCI uh, uh, Susan Samueli uh, Integrated Health Institute. He serves on the A. CGME Residency Review Committee for Psychiatry and is the medical director for the MIND OC. Dr. McCarran is also National Alliance uh, on Mental Health, Mental Illness, excuse me, NAMI board, and he's also a new member with this uh, incoming class as well. And I'd like to leave this to now doc, Dr. McCarran to start our conversation. Stuart, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And um, and by the way, for, uh, I'd like to also share with all of you. I hope it's okay, Stuart, that yeah, uh, Stuart's daughter is is moving the um, the access to psychiatry workforce even further by uh, uh, I think a second year in residency now. If that's I'm not right, psychiatry. So, uh, Stuart, thanks so much. I appreciate. it. I want to welcome everyone for joining. Um, and, you know, I, 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 for the next hour or so, I want to make this very open and um, available for, for each of you to feel free to use the chat feature. In fact, I want to start off by um, letting you know that I'm going to be talking about bipolar disorder, which includes depression and the opposite of depression, mania or hypomania. We'll talk about what that means. But I want to start out by asking, and feel free to chat in, in, in the chat feature. What what is it? Tell me what you want me to cover. Like I I have some slides here. I have a bunch of stuff I'm excited to talk to you about. But let me know. Is there anything specifically that you must know? You're dying to know. Uh, you really want to really need some information specifically on bipolar, and I will cover it for you. Okay. We want to make sure that we're getting practical, practical, evidence based information uh, for you. So. Again, excited to talk to you about destigmatizing mood disorders, uh, and particularly bipolar disorder. We so, have a question. Yeah. My brother was diagnosed bipolar at 62 years old. I often wonder if this is a, a diagnosis is correct. How, how does one know? Yeah. So 62 years 62 years old is is pretty is is pretty uh, it'd be pretty unusual to be newly diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Uh, that would be a bit unusual. Usually folks are diagnosed in their 20s and early 30s if it's severe enough. Um, and in terms of how you know if your brother's diagnosed with bipolar disorder, we're going to learn about that in this talk. We're going to dive into it. We're, you're going to know by the end of this talk, each of you are going to know exactly, exactly what bipolar disorder is. And you're also going to know how to the basics of treatment. Um, so thanks, Stuart, for that question. If there's any other questions, let me know. One other question here. Uh, what is the difference between schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, undifferentiated and, schi uh, and schizoaffective, and bipolar type? Yeah, great question. And so schizophrenia is a disorder that usually pops up in the uh, late teens, uh, particularly for men, and sometimes early mid-20s. For women, it can be a little later, early mid to late 20s. Um, schizophrenia is a disorder whereby folks have what we call psychosis. So usually hallucinations, they're hearing things or seeing things other people don't hear or see, or delusions. 
fixed false beliefs. And, uh, and that's, that's the cornerstone. And the thing with schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder is that, that, that illness is always kind of there, right? It's always kind of there. With bipolar disorder, and this is important, it comes and goes in waves. It comes and goes in waves. So I'm depressed, I'm feeling a little bit better, now I'm manic, right? And so it goes in waves. Unlike schizophrenia, it's kind of always there. One last question. Uh, what is the best rating scale to assess for bipolar? Is there still a general hesitation in the mental health community to diagnose it? And finally, in your experience, how is it best managed in patients who are inconsistent with treatment? Then we'll just go on to the presentation. Yeah, no, so we, we use the mood disorder questionnaire as a screening instrument. We're gonna talk about how to diagnose it, really how to diagnose it. And um, I don't sense that there's a hesitation to diagnose bipolar disorder. Um, I think that um, it, it's something that sometimes it's missed. The diagnosis can be missed and we'll talk about why that is. Great questions though. I wanna start off by telling you that and this is unfortunate, this, this is really unfortunate, but you gotta know this, about 60% of people out there who need treatment, who need the treatment, the psychiatric treatment, are not getting it. About 40% of the people who are getting it, aren't receiving it mostly from psychologists or psychiatrists or behavioral health specialists, but instead from primary care providers. So I, I, wanna, I wanna put that in a framework for you to understand it's important to get that information. That's why one of the reasons we're doing this at UCI, where you know, the, one of the reasons we're training primary care providers or non-psychologists, non-psychiatrists, how to how to how to deliver this care is because they're delivering most of it. They're already delivering most of it, and they didn't get the training. So we find that this is really important. But just just so you know, we need to do a better job. When I say we, I mean me and all of us need to do a better job to try and get these sixty percent of folks who are suffering really suffering with anxiety, depression, psychosis, bipolar disorder, to try and get them the right treatment. Now, talking about depression for a second here, depression is a core component of bipolar disorder. Depression is extremely common. The lifetime prevalence, uh, the, the, the frequency in which someone has depression during a lifetime is about 20%. Uh, it's a little higher for women than men. It's the leading cause of disability in this country among adults. The leading cause of disability. So that means there's there's many ramifications or consequences uh, from from this disorder and people having uh, depression. Uh, in addition to the fact that it's just a horrible thing to have and it's it it makes people obviously feel down. Um, there are there are fiscal effects, uh, uh, indirect and direct, uh, that that we also see because of this. Um, now the diagnosis of depression and bipolar disorder is missed about fifty percent of the time. Good news though, is it can be prevented, it can be treated. And I'll talk about the prevention and the treatment as well. Um, the majority of patients with depression, and this is, this is important, will not spontaneously get better without treatment within six months. However, the natural course of a discrete depressive episode is about six to nine months to two years, meaning, during yeah, six or nine months and two years, the natural course of major depressive disorder or major depressive episode is to get better without treatment. So you might be wondering, why do we have psychotherapy? Why do we have antidepressants when people are just gonna kind of get better on their own? And the answer is multifold. Number one, starting treatment will decrease the duration of that depression. Number two, it'll decrease the severity of that depression. And number three, most important, I think, is preventively, it will decrease the likelihood of future depressive episodes. Future depressive episodes. If someone has a depressive episode, let's say they're 20 years old and they have a depressive episode, it lasts a year and a half, then it goes away. The chance of them having another depressive episode is about 50% without treatment. Let's say they're not on a treatment. Um, it's a, it, then in that case, it, the chance is about 50%. If they have a second depressive episode, the chance of having a third one is about 85%. So having someone getting psychotherapy and learning how to deal with depression, someone getting someone on an antidepressant, for example, decreases the duration, the severity, and the likelihood of future episodes. That's why we stress treatment. Um, lack of recovery is associated with more and more severe episodes of the future. 
So my advice is to partner with your provider. Partner with your provider. I just gave a talk this morning to the uh, organization that, um, that endorses California osteopathic family medicine providers. And, um, and, and that my message was the same to them. Partner with, with your patients, right? Partner with them uh, as a team. And I think that's the best way to attack bipolar disorder. My wife made me put a picture of me in the slides here. So you can see this guy here is trying to get into to, to school, Midvale School for the Gifted. He's pushing instead of pulling. I put this slide up because I'm stressing the importance of education. With education, we can expand access. With education, we can optimize care. Now, that doesn't mean just education for doctors, nurses, psychologists. It means education for all of us. And that's why I'm glad that we have uh, 35 of you here on with us today, because learning about the intricacies and the changes of medicine, in this case, bipolar disorder and depression, is very, very important. So this slide is a slide that I use to teach primary care providers. And I'm sharing it with you because I want you to know the most important questions that a provider can ask if there's a question about uh, mental illness in, 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 in someone who they may be seeing. And so I wanna walk this through you. We're, we're teaching primary care providers nationally to use this AMPS approach, A-M-P-S. And this is not an all-inclusive, this doesn't cover everything, but it covers the most important, the most frequently encountered uh, behavioral health issues, right? And so, um, and I want to walk this through you, right? walk this uh, through with you. And so the A for an AMPS stands for anxiety. Anxiety is very, very common, and it's also treatable. So asking someone, hey, is anxiety or nervousness a problem for you is definitely a must, right? Particularly if you're a primary care provider, um, you know, asking about that is really, really going to be important. The M is mood, right? Asking someone, hey, how is your mood? Um, there, there are two com sub components to mood. The first is depression and the second one is mania or hypomania. And I want to go through that a little bit with you. I'm going to go through this with you and, and giving you this information, I think, um, non providers mostly, I think can help you understand a little bit more about how we diagnose, how we screen for uh, depression and mania. So there are two questions that we pretty routinely ask in the primary care setting um, when we're screening for depression, when we're figuring out, does someone have depression? And the first question is really straightforward. Have you been feeling sad or depressed over the last two weeks? It's an easy question. The second question is, have you been, um, have you been doing things that you previously used to like to do, right? And the, another way to ask it is, what do you normally like to do for fun and have you been doing those things? And if the, if the patient in this case is, is, is struggling with feeling depressed or struggling with low interest in things, then we know that there's a possibility depression might be an issue. And we go further and ask certain questions and we'll go into those questions. But this is kind of a two, two question screener, if you will. Now, we also ask about mania and hypomania. And there, there, there are two ways to ask about this. There's two questions. The first question is, have you ever felt the complete opposite of depressed? Abnormally happy where friends and family were worried about you because you were too happy or too excited or too talkative. Now notice it, it's beneficial to bring in the um, feedback, indirect feedback on, on, on family members and friends. Right. What, do you, what have your family members and friends thought? Have you ever, have they ever been worried about you because you're too happy, too excited? The second question is an important question when you're screening for past manic or hypomanic uh, symptoms. Um, have you ever had a lot of energy running through your body, so much energy that because of that energy, you didn't need to sleep for days and days at a time, right? And so those are two, two questions we can ask regarding mania. The P is psychosis. I talked a little bit about that earlier. Do you ever hear things other people don't hear, see things other people don't see? And then do you have thoughts people are trying to get you, follow you, hurt you, or spy on you? Paranoid delusions are the most common type of delusion found in, in those who have schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. 
And then we'll finish with S, substance misuse, right? And then, um, you know, usually alcohol is something that's pretty easy to ask. How much alcohol do you drink a day? Alcohol is the most used and misused substance in this country. So asking about it from a provider standpoint is really important. So as a family member, you may hear that. You may hear providers asking about that. And then the other question is uh, use of drugs. Do you use any cocaine, heroin, acid, speed, ecstasy, marijuana? Important to ask, not, as, not, not only as a family member, but as a provider, because use of these substances can mimic the symptoms, can mimic the symptoms of a mood disorder like depression or bipolar disorder. I'm going to pause here for a second and see, Stuart, any questions or comments that I should address at this point? Unmuting. Uh, uh, I have not seen anything. Okay, great. Uh, uh, Sophia is saying, yes, one second. She's actually going to send us something. But keep okay. going, and then we'll just next. Uh, next uh, yeah. Again, yeah. everyone, I want this to be... I want this to be very relevant and user friendly for each of you individually. That's what's most important to me. Um, so we'll move on and Stuart, just jump in if there's anything. So let's look at how we diagnose major depressive disorder. How do we diagnose it, right? And we talked earlier about the two, those two screener questions, depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure, those two. If either of those two pop up, then we have to go further and figure out if there are more symptoms of major depressive disorder, and if there are, if there are four of the following here that we'll talk about, then that person has a major depressive episode, if that makes sense. So in addition to depression or loss of interest in, or pleasure, we're looking at changes in sleeping patterns. It could be sleeping more or sleeping less. Usually it's sleeping less, it's sleeping less if um, the patient is manic or hypomanic and it's sleeping more if they're depressed. We have a question here, which is, uh, would you please share a few examples of how we as peers, friends, family members can direct, detect psychosis in both a manic episode and also psychosis with schizophrenia if possible? Yeah. Um, tell me, Stuart, tell me the very big, the first sentence there, I missed it. Hello, would you please share a few examples of how we as peers, friends, and family members can detect psychosis in both a manic episode and also psychosis with schizophrenia, if possible. Yeah. So kind yeah. of delineating those. Yeah, so psychosis, again, there's two main components to psychosis. There are, there are a few more, but the two main ones would be hallucinations and delusions. Someone who's manic can appear psychotic, just like someone who has schizophrenia. Um, it's indistinguishable. But the difference is with schizophrenia, people are usually gonna be like that, kind of ongoing. With mania or bipolar disorder, it's gonna come in waves, psychotic and not psychotic. Maybe psychotic later and then not psychotic. Um, and then the two components to psychosis that we look at would be um, well, hallucinations, right? And then also delusions, a fixed, but yet false belief uh, that something's going on. Usually those delusions are centered in paranoia, um, fear that, you know, someone's after them or following them, something along those lines. I hope that answers your question, uh, but really the two core components would be hallucinations, ha having someone that believing that you know someone is seeing something or hearing something that that they're really not seeing or hearing um, and then going back to depression uh, we we see that you know we have again these are the other criteria that we look at changes in sleep patterns changes in appetite or weight so eating more or less can go either way something we call psychomotor agitation or retardation and what that means is someone is really ramped up and they're pacing and they're they're moving around and usually that means they're manic and if someone's kind of moving slow and they're talking slow, usually that's consistent with depression. And then we have yeah. loss, of, loss of energy. Sometimes folks can have more fatigue, uh, feeling of worthlessness and guilt, difficulty focusing and concentrating. Now I see a lot of folks diagnosed with ADHD who have depression, right? And they're treated with ADHD, um, attention deficit disorder, but, but really it's the depression that's dragging them down in terms of uh, energy and concentration and focus. And then of course, lastly, but certainly of high importance is people who are depressed 
are more likely to have um, thoughts of death or suicide. Um, another question, uh, long-term recovery and how bipolar disorder changes as one ages. I've heard it often becomes less severe with age, and I'm curious if this is true in your experience. Yeah, great question. The, the natural course for bipolar disorder is that it start, we call this an index episode, it start with depression. That's the normal course. Usually most folks will start with a depressive episode, not a manic episode, where manic episode is something we're gonna talk about in a second, where folks are, are really the opposite of depressed. They're really wound up, a lot of energy, they're not sleeping. Um, usually it starts with a depressive episode. Um, during the course of someone's life with bipolar disorder, they may normally have more depressive episodes than manic episodes. And um, what I have seen in the literature supports this is as people get older, they're gonna, they're gonna be less likely to be manic. They're gonna be less likely to have manic episodes, generally speaking. Um, I'm, I'm just working with a gentleman who's in his mid seventies in, in the middle of a manic episode as I tell you this, but generally speaking, we see more of the, the, the uh, very difficult manic episodes in the earlier part of life. Good question. Another good question. What outpatient treatments are available? My daughter is diagnosed with bipolar one. Yeah. So um, thanks for bringing that question up. You know, I think getting the step one would be getting your daughter connected with a primary care provider and also a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist should be working closely also with a therapist who could be a, you know, for example, a social worker, a psychologist, um, uh, and, and psychiatrists also do psychotherapy. So I think getting your daughter as much support as possible is going to be helpful. Um, you've taken the first step by attending the NAMI conference, right? That you're going to get a lot of support and a lot of resources from NAMI. Um, it also depends on where you live regionally. Some, some counties, for example, or cities may have, um, may have more support than others. Um, and so it's, that's going to be a, a variable to consider as well. But getting your daughter connected with primary care, if not done so already, and also uh, with a psychiatrist would be step one and two. You're getting a DSM-5 question. Is schizophrenic psychosis still a minimum of six months under the DSM-5? It is, yeah. DSM-5 is changing in a little bit, in, in, a, in a handful of months, to what we call DSM-5 TR, text revision. And um, so there are going to be some changes in there, but six months is the amount of time. If someone is psychotic for two or three months, but then they clear up, um, and it's not really a problem thereafter, then they don't have the diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. So in this case, it's six months is the time frame. Have you seen negative symptoms of psychosis in bipolar disorder like you do in schizophrenia? Yeah, so the question is, are there negative symptoms, right, found in bipolar disorder? Um, and, and for those of you who may not know, there, in schizophrenia, there's positive symptoms and negative symptoms. The positive symptoms are the ones that are really obvious. They're the ones that you know, show that, you know, that the person is, is struggling with hallucinations, with delusions. The negative symptoms are really consistent with someone feeling down and depressed, maybe demoralized, nihilistic. And, and, and um, so we do sometimes see, that's a great question. We do sometimes see this, and I'll give you an example. It's most often when we see what's called a mixed episode, a mixed episode. A mixed episode has a little flavor of depression and a little flavor of mania all mixed in. So here you have a person who's really goal directed, they don't want to sleep, they have a lot of energy, but at the same time, their thoughts are very dark. They're very dark. They're not happy thoughts. Uh, your typical manic patient will, or manic individual will have thoughts that are not, that are not dark. In fact, they're, they're happy and they're excessively goal directed and they're energetic and they're, and they're um, innovative right? And they're, they're, these, these folks are very excited. Um, but if someone has a mixed episode, you can see, I guess you could call it sort of the, the dark, um, the darkness as well, you know, that you sometimes see. Um, That's the end of our questions. Great. Thank you, Stuart. Um, there's a mnemonic that we sometimes use, SIG, E-CAPS, right, which kind of goes through the diagnostic criteria, sleep, interest, guilt, energy, you know, changes in energy, uh, decreased concentration, changes in appetite, changes in how we move, do we move slower or faster, and then suicide. 
This is the PHQ-9. The PHQ-9 is, is more frequently used these days in the primary care settings to prevent, to diagnose early depression. And this is uh, sort of a checklist. There's nine points to it. Uh, you rate it. Anything over 10 is uh, potentially problematic and something that we should be addressing. So fortunately, we see this used a lot more in the non-psychiatric setting in order to, to uh, find people who are struggling with depression. Now, we've talked about one big part of bipolar disorder, which is depression. Let's talk a little bit about manic episodes. So a manic episode is a distinct, distinct period. It's not something that you see for months and months and years and years, like schizophrenia. It's a distinct period, usually weeks, just weeks, several weeks, where someone's really expansive, maybe very irritable and very, very elevated and euphoric. Um, the duration has to be at least one week or need for hospitalization. And these are the these are how we diagnose someone with a manic episode. Um, really elevated self-esteem or, you know, grandiosity. Um, they don't need to sleep. We talked about that earlier. Much more talkative than usual. Quick thoughts that are just moving, just quick, quick, quick. Um, these folks often tend to be very distractible. Um, they have a lot of goals, right? They tend to want to accomplish a lot of things in a short period of time. Um, they, they have excessive involvement in what didn't used to be pleasurable activities to the point where it could be detrimental. So for example, maxing out multiple credit cards, um, buying things that you wouldn't usually buy. This results in significant dysfunction of their life, right? And this is an overview right here um, of what a discrete manic episode looks like. Now remember, someone who's manic isn't like this all the time. They're not like this all the time. Usually it'll go for you know several weeks and hopefully much less if there's if there's treatment involved. And so to make this a little more visual, this line right here in the middle where I have uh, the pointer, right here in the middle is what we call the uh, euthymia. Euthymia is a fancy word of saying things are pretty okay emotionally. Things are good, right? Euthymia. And so um, if someone is feeling less than euthymia, you can see this green line, they're going to come down here and, and have a depressive episode. Now that depressive episode um, over time will come back up to euthymia, but it could elevate to what we call hypomania, which is a lower level mania or mania. And that's, that's a full manic, manic episode. And then the natural course cyclically is it kind of comes down again. It kind of comes down again. And so you can visualize... Um, again, the cycles that we see, euthymia, everything's pretty good. Oh my gosh, I'm feeling pretty depressed. And this could remain depression for a while. It usually goes up to euthymia, but it could go to hypomania or bipolar disorder. Now, if someone never reaches mania, full mania, where their life is a mess because they're so disorganized and they, they're just so happy and excited and talkative and they don't, they don't sleep for days, we call that bipolar type 1. Bipolar type 1. If, however, they don't quite reach that manic phase, but a little bit less. You know, they don't need to be admitted to the hospital, but they have a little more energy than they usually do. Um, we call that bipolar 2. Bipolar 2, which is a, a less severe sort of case of bipolar disorder. Right? And so that's how we designate bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. And I put this up here because... I was hoping it'd be a little more visual and you can kind of get a, you know, a bird's eye view of, of how this, of how this uh, turns out and how this works. We have some other questions. Yeah. How do you treat a patient with bipolar and severe ADHD? It seems confusing. Who asked that question, Stuart? <laughs> can I know the first name? Uh, I don't have names. Okay. Because that is an awesome question. And I just got to say that that is... That's a great question. And it's something that confuses me as a psychiatrist. Here's the answer to the question. When I have someone, I'm seeing someone who has bipolar disorder and I think they're hypomanic or manic, I don't make the diagnosis of ADHD at that time because I'm thinking that their difficulty with concentration and focus and inattention, all of that is probably related to the bipolar disorder. That's what I'm thinking. So with that being said, I will treat the bipolar disorder with the patient. I'll treat, to, we'll treat together and, and oftentimes their concentration will get better, their attention will get better. And then I, I, I 
they, they won't have, they, they, they won't have ADHD and I won't have to worry about giving them a stimulant. Um, let me go a little further and tell you a, a little bit more about what I'm thinking here. I think ADHD can in some cases be over diagnosed, over diagnosed, therefore over treated. Um, I'm a huge fan of less is more. Let's pathologize as least as we can. And let's not give tons of medications, but only the dose needed and the medications needed. Huge believer in that. Huge believer. And let's let the body heal itself as much as we can. All right. I just, I firmly believe in that. Um, now, with that said, I mean, obviously, there's times when medications are needed, but I just think sometimes we ha might have a tendency when I say we, I mean, providers to over pathologize. And instead of saying, I think this person has ADHD and bipolar disorder, I'm going to take my time and treat the bipolar disorder, hoping that the symptoms of ADHD go away. I hope that answers your question. It's a great, great question. Really appreciate that. A couple more quick questions. Yeah. Are there some types of bipolar that are harder to treat or even untreatable? Um, let me answer that. By the way, Olga, I found out it was you that asked that question. So thank you for that question. That was awesome. I really appreciated you bringing that up. Um, there's bipolar type one and bipolar type two. And I think bipolar type one is usually more difficult to treat because it's more severe. Bipolar type two is less difficult to treat. Uh, pay, uh, folks uh, end, end up less in the hospital uh, and um, do better overall. They have a better prognosis. So bipolar type one, worse prognosis than bipolar type two. Please clarify. You said six months prior to diagnosis. Then you said one week for symptoms, uh, one week of symptoms for mania. Yeah, so, I th so the question earlier, I think, was related to schizophrenia, if I'm not mistaken. Schizophrenia, you have to have six months of, of uh, symptoms before you can make that diagnosis. And that's a chronic illness, by the way. Now, with bipolar disorder, in order to have a discrete manic episode, you have to have at least one week of symptoms or hospitalization, either one, one week or hospitalization. For schizophrenia, you have to have a constellation of symptoms for six months or longer. I hope that clarifies. Yeah, good, good clarification. How can schools help a student who is having a manic episode? Oh, that's a great question. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, our, our group at University of California Irvine has been in touch with, you know, a large school district to look um, at providing education on behavioral health to leaders, teach leaders who, who are in the, in the school system, K through 12. Um, and I think it goes back to what I said earlier. I think education and training is so, so important. And it's not just education for medical students or residents, it's education for all of us, teachers, students, parents. Um, I think we're in the position now where we should be training, we should be training uh, principals, vice principals, teachers, how to recognize early symptoms, early symptoms, right? I think that's so important. Why not do that? I mean, this stuff is so common. This depression, anxiety, psychosis, all bipolar disorder, this influences and affects all of us to some degree, whether we're, whether we're afflicted with this, whether we're family or friends or teachers dealing with this. So um, my answer to your question is education, education, education. Let's do, a, let, let's think out of the box and let's detect early these symptoms, right? Let's prevent, prevent badness by detecting early symptoms. This is my thought on, on, the, on your question. It's a great question. Can psychosis be associated or cause by something outside of the bipolar schizophrenia? Is there some external causation? Of psychosis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so psychosis can be caused by a lot of different things. Psychosis can be caused by methamphetamines. Psychosis can be caused by a brain tumor. Psychosis can be caused um, uh, by a psychiatric illness, including depression. Depression, really bad depression can result in, in subtle psychosis. 
It can be caused uh, by bipolar disorder. It can be caused by schizophrenia. Um, there are many different things that can cause psychosis. So from a physician standpoint, whenever I see someone with psychosis, I never just automatically say, um, oh my gosh, this is schizophrenia. I don't, I don't do that. I, I look at the whole, whole person, do a, do a full exam and figure out what might be happening. So for example, let's say a 78-year-old person comes in and they're psychotic and they're seeing me. The last thing I'm thinking is schizophrenia. The last thing I'm thinking is bipolar disorder. I want to do a physical exam. I want to talk to the person, talk to the family, and figure out what's causing the psychosis. I've seen many, 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 many people coming in with psychosis caused by a mass in the brain or a recent bleed in the brain, right? And so um, these symptoms that we see uh, are not always due to a pure psychiatric cause. Great question. So um, Olga's uh, wanting to ask a follow-up question if she can. My daughter was diagnosed with ADHD early in life. She couldn't function without the medication. Later, she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Could it be that she doesn't have bipolar instead of her not having ADHD? Could you, uh, No, that's so. not yeah, that's unlikely. You can't mistake bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder doesn't look like schizophrenia, doesn't look like ADHD, but ADHD can look like bipolar disorder, right? So if someone really has bipolar disorder and they've had a clear manic or a hypomanic episode, that doesn't really look like ADHD. That, that's, that looks different. And, and it also has different functional outcomes as well, right? Um, so excessive spending, maybe sexual promiscuity, doing things you wouldn't normally do, excessive talking, even more than ADHD. Um, it, you know, there, there are some things that there are some overlapping symptoms, but diagnosing someone with a discrete, discrete episode of mania um, is going to look a lot different than ongoing chronic ADHD. Good question. Yeah. Could you speak to the spectrum of bipolar disorder. Yeah, yeah, so the spectrum of bipolar disorders, there's, there's type one and type two. That's the spectrum. Um, some people, you know, might fit in between, but I'm a purist. I believe if they've had a manic episode and, I, and it's labeled a manic episode, they're bipolar type one. That's what they are, that's what happens. And that's their diagnosis going forward. Uh, if it's bipolar type two, it's bipolar type two. People with bipolar type two, can have a manic episode later and then their diagnosis changes from bipolar type two to type one, right? The treatment is still similar. Uh, usually the prognosis is not as good with bipolar type one. That's it. I love your questions, everyone. This is awesome. And the reason I love your questions is because I wanna make this practical for all of you, right? I wanna make this uh, really relevant for all of you. And I think part of doing that is looking at medications, right? A lot of our loved ones are on medications. We might be on medications. And I, I think it's fair that we learn a little bit about medications, right? Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, I'll be, I'll be seeing a patient and they'll say, okay, well, you're the doctor, I'll just take this medication. And I encourage them to, to learn about the medication outside of what I'm saying, to read up on it, right? And, and, and to take the medication sort of as a team together. So we're working on it together um, and to learn about these medications. So with that being said, if we look at treatment of depression, there, these are the main sort of areas that we look at in terms of medications. The SSRIs or serotonin specific reptic inhibitors, they basically work on the serotonin system. Then we have the serotonin norepinephrine reptic inhibitors. They work in two systems. Mirtazapine kind of does its own thing and bupropion works on the dopamine and norepinephrine system. So SSRIs and SNRIs are probably the most commonly widely prescribed antidepressants. They do unfortunately have the side effect of what we call sexual dysfunction. About 40% of people will have some type of sexual dys dysfunction. Usually it's decreased libido, but it can be other things like um, delayed ejaculation or um, inability to maintain an erection or inability to get an orgasm, things like that. Um, weight gain, you see not as much with these medications. Sedation, not so much. Uh, mirtazapine or Remeron is the other medication that we sometimes use can cause a lot of weight gain and sedation, but not a lot of sexual side effects. Bupropion or Welbutrin is a medication that we use as a first line antidepressant, but it can sometimes cause or worsen anxiety. So we be careful with this medication. 
Um, but this medication, as you see, has really minimal side effects. So that's the bonus there. Here's the thing I want to say. We don't use these medications alone by themselves with people who have bipolar disorder. We have to give, if we are going to give these medications, we have to counterbalance it with another type of medication called a mood stabilizer. Then I'll talk about that in a second. So these are some of the specific names of SSRIs, these medications that affect the serotonin system. And so we have Zoloft and we have Paxil, we have Prozac or Fluoxetine, uh, Celexa and Lexapro. I think a lot of these names are probably familiar to you because we see them on TV, on commercials, and you may have friends and family who take them. Um, so these medications, again, are first line, commonly used, widely prescribed uh, medications uh, for treatment of mood disorders, but mainly in this case, depression. Um, I'll go through them very quickly to tell you, I think the most important things to know about them. Zoloft is a medication that's, that's safe on the heart, the kidney, the liver, the brain. It's a medication that can be very helpful for both depression and anxiety. Paroxetine or Paxil had its heyday back in the 90s. Um, I don't use it very much anymore because it has a lot more side effects. So I don't use that as much. Prozac is back from the 1980s. Um, it was the first SSRI developed and it can be very effective for depression and anxiety. And then we have Celexa and Lexapro, which are very much structurally similar. In fact, if you take one and you show it in a, and you put it in front of a mirror, the molecules are the same. They're just, they're just, they're mirror images of each other. They're called enantiomers. And so um, they work pretty well, actually. And Lexapro, Celexa, and Zoloft are probably good medications to take if you have someone who's on a lot of different medications for medical problems, because these three medications have decreased chance for drug-drug interactions. We have a couple questions, if you want to take a breath. Sure, sure. Uh, what, what's the role, of, uh, what role can one's diet play in the treatment of bipolar disorder? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, this takes me to, as you, you heard me mention earlier, let the body heal itself. I think a balanced, healthy diet uh, in general is going to be good. There's not one specific diet or fad diet, if you will, that's going to be helpful. Um, for example, uh, lower carbohydrates or an anti-inflammatory diet or low fat diet. But I think more importantly, a balanced diet, a balanced diet with balanced sleep if, as much as you can get it, um, and regular exercise, all those three are cornerstones to, um, to, to maintaining what, remember we said euthymia, which is a healthy, normal mood. Um, if, you, if someone is just having fast food all the time, um, you know, for example, and there's not a very balanced approach to the diet, that could certainly make, I think, matters worse as well. So good question. We have another sort of a personal question. Uh, someone who's been through a lot, it sounds like. I'm a bipolar one attorney who is always contemporaneously and retrospectively frustrated with heavily forced, uh, often traumatic involuntary hospitalization during uh, manic psychosis because I know I don't meet the legal criteria for a hold. In your practice, do you have an effective approach to persuade someone like me into a voluntary hospitalization? How? How can you communicate in a way that helps people voluntarily get treatment? Yeah. You know, here's my take on it. It's always ideal to um, work with someone, you know, voluntarily. And it's also, it's also best if it can be done to treat outside of the hospital setting. I try and keep patients out of the hospital all the time. Um, and I think one of the best things that that we can do as providers, and I'm just sharing this with you because I know most of you probably are not providers, but I'm, I'm just going to share with you what I, when I, when I teach, you know, my colleagues, um, I, I, I use the, the two words I use very frequently. The first is team and the other is partner. Um, and again, I just gave a talk today to a bunch of family medicine docs in California about motivational interviewing, right? And so um, I, th I think in, we have to have trust in our, in the person we're working with. We have to, there has to be a trust, right? And it's going to be hard to go involuntarily if you, you, you don't feel like someone's listening or trying to understand or doing their best to understand. Um, so my answer to you would be to do your best to find that provider who you really can connect with to trust 
and to partner with? That's important. Another great question. Can you address med compliance and breakthrough symptoms? And how can family members share behavior observations that loved ones will be receptive to? Yeah, so, you know, um, med compliance is, is tricky. Uh, you know, sometimes we'll use the word med adherence or treatment adherence. Um, I think this is complicated, but to answer your question, I would say this, this is, this is what I would say. I would say, if you're a family member, do your best to understand the angst, the confusion, and the difficulty that your loved one is dealing with. Try and connect with that as much as you can. If they're refusing to take medication, it's usually not because they're just trying to be honorary or they're, 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 they're mean-spirited or they're trying to be bad, but maybe they're fearful. Maybe they're scared that it will this medication will change them in a bad way or that it could affect them adversely from a medical standpoint. So try and understand why they why they won't take it instead of saying instead of just realizing they need to take it. What are they struggling with? What is their struggle? And and to try and understand that concretely, that can be very, very difficult. Um, this is my approach, though. This is the approach that I use instead of you got to take this medication. I try and figure out why are they not taking the medication and it can be challenging. It really can be. Um, so again, a couple of these medications I want to go through, venlafaxine, desilinafaxine, and duloxetine are SNRIs. They affect norepinephrine and the serotonin system. We talked about bupropion and, 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 and remeron a little bit. I want to introduce you to some of the treatments with bipolar disorder, and there aren't many of them, right? And, and really what it comes down to is these medications here. These are what we call mood stabilizers. These medications, including lithium and Depakote, these two medications will sort of attenuate that mania, mania or hypomania. These are the two medications that we use preferentially. If someone's doing pretty good, they have a history of bipolar disorder, one or two, they're doing pretty good, they're euthymic, sometimes we'll give them Lamotrigine or Lamictal to maintain that mood. It's a, it's a mood maintainer. Lithium and Depakote are used when someone's in a manic episode and they're just not themselves. And these are medications that we use to try and help them get through that episode quicker and with less severity. So I wanna introduce you to these medications. I will say lithium is an interesting medication because it is probably one of the best. It's awesome. It's a great medication, but um, the patient and, and, the, and the provider just really need to look at certain side effects and be aware of those side effects. These are some other medications we use that help stabilize the mood, but they're called atypical antipsychotics. Um, they're also used in the treatment of schizophrenia, but these medications like Risperidol, Seroquel, Zyprexa, and Abilify, these medications can be used in addition or in lieu of, in addition or in lieu of lithium and Depakote. If someone comes in the emergency room and they're really, 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 really manic, I'm gonna put them or suggest that they take lithium or Depakote and one of these medications here, both, combination therapy, to really get them feeling better, less manic, less riled up, um, and, and that may just be for a short period of time. But that's an overview on how we look at medication treatment for medication treatment for depression and for bipolar disorder, uh, just kind of a quick 30,000 foot level, keeping in mind that sleep, diet, exercise, also critically important. More great questions coming your way. If, bi if, uh, if a bipolar patient refuses medical treatment because of the side effects, how do family members encourage the person to use the available resource? Yeah, so I think I think working with a provider to find a medication or medications that will have low side effect profile uh, or the lowest side effect profile, um, you know, is the way to go. There are newer medications. For example, this month we're coming out with a medication that has um, it's like a dual medication. So it has a Prexa, which is great for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, but it causes a lot of weight gain. This new pill adds a second medication component to the Zyprexa, which decreases the risk for weight gain. Mm -hmm. So we are, there's a Latuda is another medication that came out several years ago um, that has really 
minimal, if any, weight gain or problems with high cholesterol or high gluc blood glucose level. Um, so finding that right combination can be difficult for the family and the, and the person who's dealing with the illness and also the provider. But what I usually say is stick with it. Let's work together. Let's make it happen. It'll take some time. Let's find that right combination. One more question, then we'll let you go on. Please speak to the recent culture of using cannabis for treating depression in lieu of medication. Yeah, so cannabis is a medication that um, that that react can, can 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 give different reactions in different people. It can give different reactions in different people. So cannabis, for some, might cause us a little subtle paranoia. It depends on the strength of the cannabis too and the strain, but it can cause a little sudden paranoia. For some, it can cause people to be really relaxed and calm. Um, unfortunately, we do see with marijuana, um, there's an increase in uh, ca causing or worsening anxiety. And so that's not something we want, certainly. Um, it, it, I have not seen it really have a strong effect either way, adverse, adversely or otherwise, on depression. I certainly don't recommend it for people who have schizophrenia. Um, but I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure really if it has a lot of positive effect for those who have just strict major depressive disorder. Again, don't recommend it for bipolar, don't recommend it for schizophrenia uh, because of the propensity to cause or worsen psychosis. Good question though. My son is uh, diagnosed with bipolar once, started symptoms at age 15 with depression and mania. He has uh, experienced psychosis, paranoia, and hallucinations. He's been on antipsychotics. He's a high school senior now. His psychosis is not always there. So I'm not sure if he's really schizophrenic or schizoaffective. Is the treatment and medication the same for bipolar one? Yeah, it's well, yeah. First, let me, ask, let me just say that, do we know who wrote that, Stuart, first name or no? I, I don't have it. You can put that in if you'd like. No, that's fine. I have to tell you, the reason I'm asking is uh, as a parent, um, that's a big deal. And mm -hmm. I, I want to, I want to take a second and give you some support over zoom. That's not easy. That is just not easy. There's nothing easy about that. And so I applaud you for attending this conference and being there and, and going through this struggle. Um, not easy. Okay. And so that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing is there, there is some overlap is some overlap um, between the treatment of schizophrenia and the treatment of bipolar disorder. There are some differences too. I think the first step before we use a bunch of different medications and look at overlaps is to figure out what is that diagnosis. It would be a little bit unusual um, to be diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia uh, before the age of 13 or 14. It would be unusual. Um, it would also be a bit unusual to be diagnosed with bipolar disorder uh, at that age, although more likely than schizophrenia. Schizophrenia doesn't usually develop in full form until uh, later in high school, and that's when that kind of starts, or college, actually. Um, you could have the precursors, or what we call prodromal, sim prodromal symptoms, uh, that take place uh, before schizophrenia starts, and, and that, that could also be in play. It, the question is a great one, um, I, and there is some overlap with medications. Hard for me to know from a diagnostic standpoint without seeing your son, but I appreciate your question very much. Mm -hmm. Someone's asking about hypoglycemia and whether it can look like bipolar. Yeah. Um, Latina, by the way, thanks for your question, by the way. Thanks for that. Um, uh, hyper uh, cholesterol level, high cholesterol level? Uh, uh, um, hypoglycemia. Oh, hypoglycemia. Yeah, hypoglycemia yeah. Is, is will not cause symptoms of bipolar or schizophrenia. It, it will not. No. Okay. So, so common symptoms of hyperglycemia or high blood sugar include peeing a lot, drinking a lot, and kind of maybe fatigue and low energy. Do you consider anosognosia a separate condition from bipolar? How uh, long does it last? Uh, no, that would be more along the lines of some type of memory issue, uh, which, you know, could result in a tumor or mass or some type of stroke or lesion in a certain part of the brain. Uh, I don't 
see that as a part of the spectrum for bipolar or schizophrenia? That's it for the questions. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I want to thank everyone for, um, for joining. I, I really appreciate all about 40 of you. Um, really appreciate you, you joining and hanging out with Stuart and myself. Um, I hope this was helpful. I hope you walk away learning some basics on, hey, what is depression and bipolar? How do you prevent it? Uh, what are some things you can do to prevent it? What are some of the common medications and their side effects and how effective are they? Um, and, and, and certainly want to encourage all, all of you to stay connected with, with NAMI, both regionally and the state and nationally um, as a resource. And coming back to these annual conferences, I hope are high yield uh, for all of you. I know they are for me. So um, again, I'm happy to take any last minute questions before we finish up. Stuart, do we have anything? I don't see anything. So I'm going to thank you all for joining us today. And thank you so much, Dr. McCarran, for your wonderful discussion and, and answering of questions in such a straightforward, clear manner. For any questions on the content, please feel free to email presenter. For any questions or concerns for today's event, please feel free to email nami.california at namica.org. You are welcome to leave the session to, to move on to the next part of your agenda, but there's no next part of your agenda. So I would ask you to, before we uh, before we leave, we, we want to share our closing message from Jessica Cruz, our CEO. So please, please hang out with us for a little longer. And please remember to take, uh, take some time uh, after the sessions uh, to take care of yourself, self-care. You know, there, there may have been some things in this conversation or other conversations that affected you. So please, uh, please take care of yourself. <laughs>